let's get started. Welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to the lightning talks around teaching tools. So we've got a great set of speakers all lined up, ready to go. Um, I think we're going to save questions for the end. If we do have any time at the end, we'll be able to do a, questions for all of them at once, kind of do a panel questionnaire if, if we have time at the end. So. All right, uh, first up, John. Yeah. Okay. Um, this this talk is actually Anisha Bakari's talk. Um, she wasn't able to come, so I'm doing the talk. I'm John Zorning. He's Jack also. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm from UQX, the University of Queensland in Australia. Um, we make MOOCs, uh, done quite a lot of them. Um, Currently, uh, the development team at UQX um, spends a lot of their time doing LTI tools. Um, all of our courses are very interactive, um, so we, we build a lot of uh, tools that um, engage students in, in various activities, um, kind of active online learning. Um, uh, they're mainly developed in PHP and Python. Um, but Anisha's been researching LTI deployment to AWS Lambda. Uh, when I read, read about AWS Lambda, I told Anisha, this is really cool sounding technology. You should have a look at it and see if we can do something. Um, and uh, so she's run off and explored how to use it for LTI tools. Um, she wanted the ability to be able to revert back to server deployment of, of the LTI tools if necessary. Um, so we didn't want to uh, rewrite the LTI tools in you know, a new language or something like that. We wanted to retain the PHP or, or Django style of coding. Um, but you know, we have tools that you know, have potentially a high number of requests, you know, a lot of very popular courses. Um, and you know, potentially in the future we might want to move to, to any uh, alternative platform, something like that. So what is serverless with AWS Lambda? It's basically you don't worry about servers anymore. Um, you write code that responds to requests and effectively Amazon spins up a server for you for the few microseconds it takes to service your request. And that way, if you have a trillion requests come in, they all get served. Um, none of them have to wait. Um, we initially were looking at this for our uh, marketing email distribution, because currently we have sent a million emails every month. Uh, it takes a week to send them. Um, but with AWS Lambda, we could potentially send them in five minutes uh, or less, a few seconds. Um, there's still a server, but it only has this very short lifespan, lifetime. AWS handles the scaling. So the solution that we found to run LTIs is a thing called Zapper. It lets you deploy a WSGI app on AWS Lambda. It takes um, um, away all the tedious uh, configuration of web servers. You don't have to you know, uh, worry about security or load balancing, anything like that, um, Lambda does all of that for you. There's the, uh, uh, the URL for the, the GitHub. It lets you uh, use uh, various web frameworks, Django or Flask, uh, different versions of Python, um, lets you uh, deploy and update your app. Package up your application in a local virtual environment into a Lambda compatible archive, 
It replaces any dependencies with pre-compiled versions uh, for the Lambda setup. Um, you upload the archive to S3, you create your, your policies and so forth, create a new uh, gateway resource, and pretty much that's it. Uh, Lambda looks after the rest. Um, to use it for LTI, we use the uh, Flask web framework, because um, that's a smaller memory footprint than Django, uh, at the PyLTI library, um, and we've got a, a proof of concept uh, available on GitHub at that URL. If you do need to use a database, so if you want to st uh, re um, uh, store state in your LTI tool, um, it's AWS DynamiteDB is available. It's a NoSQL database. Um, it's you know, quite limited in the uh, sorts of queries you can run, uh, but for, for basic things that you might use in an LTI tool, it's probably um, got what you need. Um, there's an interesting article at that URL that talks about the limitations and, and why you would or wouldn't use it in different circumstances. So that's it. Thank you. So let's actually do Q&A as we go, just so we don't lose the context. So if anybody does have questions, we have a minute or two for Q&A. Lightning Q&A. Not that I'll be able to answer any really technical question on this, because it's not my stuff. Any questions? What, what's an example of an LTI application that can cleave in 40 milliseconds? Well, it will run for longer than that, it has to be. But effectively, it, it runs a virtual instance for every request that comes in. So it's not as if you have a, a server that's you know, having to respond to requests and so it queues them and um, some requests might time out with Lambda. It just scales to you know, a million requests come in in five minutes. You've got a million virtual servers scaled in Amazon, all, all each running on one request. So all the requests get served. Which is really great, because you don't have to worry about that. So you can have a situation where you get one request a day, and that's all the resource it uses. But when that one request comes in, it runs a virtual server for however many, many milliseconds it needs, but you could have it million requests come in in the day. And um, there's no difference for your deployment. Great, thank you. So next up we're gonna have Peter. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna try something a little crazy here and do a live demo of this uh, teaching tool. Yes. The hardest part is uh, creating an edX account. So I created some accounts ahead of time. Um, if you want to play along, you can try to log in. Um, there's usernames and passwords there. Um, and the first challenge is if I can log in. Um, so while that's going around, uh, I'll wave my hands and talk a little bit about what this is about. Um, I can find the video. Uh, so how many people know what clickers are? Clickers, okay. So the basic idea is uh, clickers replace what we just did. Instead of raising your hands, students in a lecture or at a conference, uh, press a button and that gets recorded. The information comes to the instructor and they can adjust what they're talking about accordingly. Um, so uh, we use these at MIT. Uh, they've been very popular. Um, uh, the instructor can adjust what they're talking about. Um, and there's also some data collection that goes along with that. Um, there's been some problems uh, in how that works at MIT. Um, integrating the clicker systems and the clicker data with uh, MIT systems is a little challenging. Uh, students have to pay for them. Um, and uh, lately, the uh, licensing scheme for the clickers has changed. So students used to be able to just sell their clicker when the course was done um, and get some money back. But now they have to license it per semester. Um, so uh, we want to try something else. And uh, Julian Bloomfield, uh, who works on the uh, physics department at MIT, uh, realized that we've got edX here. We use it in our physics classes already. 
Um, and uh, it uh, solves a lot of those problems because edX already knows who the students are and it already integrates with the other systems. Um, so uh, he put together uh, an LTI, uh, not in Lambda, um, uh, to try this out. We've been using it for the past year. Um, but what I'm going to show you today, any luck, uh, is a version um, that we'll be deploying uh, later this year that is more deeply integrated with edX. Uh, and the reason why we wanted to do that is we wanted to leverage the existing uh, authoring in edX um, and the grading uh, systems and then also the event logging. So we're using something called an, edX, uh, an X block SI, uh, which is uh, a small bit of code that can modify the behavior of an existing X block. Uh, if you're familiar with Python decorators, it's the same concept. Um, and uh, what I'm going to show you today is with uh, multiple choice problems, but we're going to extend this to work with uh, other types of problems and other X blocks. And I don't know how the list is doing. I'm going to try to log in here. So that's the URL instance we should go to? Uh, yeah, actually the list has a shorter URL on it. Sorry, I didn't mention that. I don't want to make you type that in. Okay. Then my next challenge is getting into studio. very quickly. Have some people been able to log in? Yes. 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 Okay. Studio. This is all to show you how easy it is to enable the rapid response behavior. Uh, this is a typical uh, multiple choice unit authored the way you normally would. Uh, when you click the edit button, um, we've added a plugins tab up here on the right. Um, I, we're still discussing this with edX, but this is the proposed location for any uh, aside uh, functionality, and we just added a checkbox. Enable problem for rapid response. So that's enabled. And then, uh, view the live version, try that again. Hopefully I'll be able to bring up what everybody else is seeing. There we go. Okay, um, this is the instructor view. Uh, what you're seeing is a little different. Um, you should have the problem, but below the problem, the uh, rapid response aside is rendering a really big graph. Um, I don't know how to zoom this out. It's, okay. um, and uh, I have a button at the top where I can open the problem. This is, imagine again that I'm lecturing and I explain some concept and I want to check for understanding. Uh, I click on open the problem. Now, for those of you who've logged in, you can start voting or answering the question. Uh, so the instructor has the choice whether they want to share this screen or they just want to leave it for themselves. Uh, and then uh, when I feel like I've given you sufficient time to answer it, I can close the problem. Uh, and if I need to, I can compare this class's responses with another class's or earlier in the same class. Uh, and that's the basic idea. Um, we're hoping that the infrastructure for the asides uh, will be able to contribute upstream. We worked uh, pretty closely with edX engineering on this. Um, and the rapid response X block is open source. Um, thank you to Jolene and MIT Physics uh, and uh, the people who are going to distribute this uh, later this year. Thanks. Any Any questions?
Is it is Hawthorne in the next release of the next? Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's Hawthorne in the Iron Man. Ah, okay. I, when I wrote this, I thought it was going to be hell. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you can run the problem multiple times, effectively. Yes, uh, that was so a requirement. You're giving the class twice in the week. Uh, in fact, uh, that's one of the ways that it's used. So it'll be used in multiple sections, um, and uh, the yeah, you have to be able to see different groups of students' responses. Um, but this all gets recorded as a regular problem, yeah. so it goes right into the grade book. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Let's see. Next up, we got Kremi after I yeah. Yeah. Hello everyone, we're going to talk about some tools that have been developed for an upcoming professional certificate called C Programming with Linux. It's a collaboration between Dartmouth College in New Hampshire and IMT in France, uh, built on previous projects at both institutions and with personnel from both sides. I'm Mike Goudsworth from Dartmouth. And Remy Sharok from Telecom Paris Tech IMT in France. So we just arrived in the room um, a few minutes before the show and uh, open this uh, Chrome browser, and we did this actually in a few minutes. Yeah. Yeah. And let me just say that one thing that we've noted about uh, our faculty and, and Remy in teaching code is a common place that beginning coders stumble is the install and configuration phase. So we're like, how can we get over that stumbling block and have them coding within minutes right within the browser in the edX window? Right, so this is a C programming demo. Hi everyone and welcome to OpenEdX, welcome to Montreal. And now we will do the famous Hello World program. Right, so I'm writing standard input output for H and then the main function, like this, braces. It was I think braces are quite difficult to find in yes. Canadian keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> and then print F. Um, and also the let me see. All right. Hello. <laughs> Open edX. I'm sure you compile and read it. Compile. All right. Compile. Oh, oh warning. Extra tokens. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, this uh, small character here. Oh, I should get rid of it. All right. Compile and run. Yeah, we have the oh. open open yeah, edX on the terminal. Did you install that in, in advance? No, no. Everything oh. is uh, on the browser. Right. Oh. Okay. So easy. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to show you more advanced features like uh, this one. So I am starting a recording now with uh, some code that I just put before. Uh, and I have a multiple uh, visualization module for memory uh, visualization or algorithm visualization. An example here is uh, to show the memory. And of course it doesn't work when I compile. Let me see why. Yeah, uh, if I execute the code uh, line by line, uh, it's very easy for the learner to, to learn the pointers uh, when they see what's happening in memory just here. And you can execute the code line by line and see exactly what's happening in memory. And everything that I just did here was recorded. When I click the stop button, it will uh, uh, compress the audio to MP3 right within the web, web browser and then I send the audio to Amazon Web Service right and I get a link that I can uh, use wherever I want as an iframe for example on uh, edX and playback like uh, this one so I am starting a recording <laughs> why yeah uh, if I execute the code the line so everything was recorded on playback like it was recorded and the student can pause the, the playback and play with the, the code anytime. And when it's in edX, you'll have a transcript, tr clickable transcript, just like right. you do for a video, um, but it's interactive. Here. Yeah. Right. On the right and also uh, at the bottom. The second tool we have is uh, Web Linux to learn uh, Linux in the browser without installing anything. So that's it. It's a knife frame that you can integrate wherever you want also. Um, 
Um, so basically, it's uh, Linux that is booted in the browser without having to have a server in the background. So even if I disconnect from the Wi-Fi, it will work. And as you can see here, we are on Windows, but we have a Linux uh, running in the browser within uh, Chrome within uh, Windows. So it's a, it's a real uh, Linux, and I can um, also um, create some files. Touch file, and I have a new file in my uh, file browser here. I can open a file, edit the code, if it is a C code. Hello, open LX. I can save it, and I can uh, compile it with a GCC. So it's compiling and then execute it. Oh my gosh. Ah, <laughs> point, point slash. <laughs> Canadian keyboard. Yeah. Hello, open it. All right, so you have a full uh, Linux uh, running in the browser, and I used it in uh, many uh, MOOCs to learn uh, Linux, the command line interface. C programming language, make files, uh, debugging, etc. So that's about our five minutes. I saw some head nods around the room. Some of you knew what was going on up on the screen. If you didn't know what was going on on the screen, September 18th, you can take our first MOOC and be programming within minutes in the browser. So we will have seven MOOCs opening for C programming language uh, from the very uh, beginning to the very complex uh, skills, and also Linux uh, command lines and you know all the tools to program and develop <coughs> on Linux. And, and edX marketing department requires me to tell you that they're very short MOOCs. They're seven short MOOCs, <laughs> so you don't get scared off. Thank you. Thanks. Questions? How is the Linux being embedded, and how much of a download is that? Um, so it's approximately, uh, for the Linux kernel, 5 megabytes, so quite, uh, quite small, uh, even in African countries. Because I used it in a French MOOC, uh, in African countries it, it takes a few minutes, but then uh, everything is in the cache, so it's quite fast. Uh, and uh, when, whenever you uh, use a binary, it will download it, download it dynamically. Uh, so, for example, GCC is maybe one megabyte, and after that you have it in the cache. Uh, it is working with the uh, emulated processor uh, written in JavaScript, and with a kernel that is compiled to, with this uh, uh, CPU. Other questions? All right, All right. Thanks. thank you. AJ here. Last up is AJ. Talking about why you should care about mobile. Hello everyone. Um, my name is AJ Sanovin. Um, I am the mobile team lead at edX. Um, currently working with four developers for Android and iOS. Uh, today I wanted to briefly discuss uh, within my five minute window here why I believe you should care about mobile. Um, a lot of the information that's in this talk is sourced from um, the talk by Luke, Luke Robleski from Google. But um, it's some really interesting information that I wanted to share. So why mobile? Um, so when I'm talking mobile today, I'm talking uh, not just native applications, but also mobile web. Um, edX has found that approximately 63% approximately of our new user sessions are coming through mobile browsers. Um, and this information becomes more relevant when we start talking about um, the other information further in the presentation, but we are also seeing uh, approximately 31% of enrollments coming through both mobile web and mobile application enrollments. And approximately 27% of active edX users are dual channel. And when I say dual channel, I mean, again, uh, mobile web browsers and again, the native applications. And why do I think that's important? Well, because your multiple channel users tend to be your most valuable. They tend to be your users who are coming back to you from for courses more frequently and more likely to upgrade. Um, mobile is also important because it enables our learners to learn on the go and gives us accessibility around the world. So for many countries, mobile is the main point of access for the users within those nations. And a lot of developing nations are mobile first. They're not even 
they don't have desktop computer access, they may not have um, access to machines that are anything more than their mobile device or tablet. So that brings the big question, right? Should I build a mobile website or should I build a native application? What, what is the best approach and strategy? Well, I don't have the answer to that, but I hope to at least provide some insight into where I believe we should go within Open edX. So mobile is still a growing market across the world, and more importantly, native app real estate is extremely limited and in constant competition. So the big app manufacturers like uh, Facebook, for example, I think the last statistic I read is that Facebook is like 60% of all app usages on mobile devices, at least within the US. So we, we're competing for space, but not only space, user attention within mobile applications. But we have this other problem here, which is a lot of mobile web app, a lot of mobile applications, sorry, a lot of web applications on mobile browsers tend to be slow and inefficient and difficult to use. Um, we've made improvements on the, the mobile web experience for Open, Edit, uh, for Open edX, but you still have issues with the speed and the ability to actually interact with some components. So what are the strengths of the two? So with native applications, you tend to have the ability to build a richer, a richness of content within the native application that is harder to achieve in the, in the browser through the use of native resources on the device. And the mobile web browsers tend to be a little bit behind the, the access to those native resources. You gain activity um, and more, and also very importantly, um, a, greater time, a greater time spent engaged within the mobile application as opposed to the web version of the application. And you can achieve a depth of content through the use of those native features. But where does the, the web exceed more than native? Reach, right? Um, more and more users will find you through a web browser than installing your app, because they may not know you exist, so why would they install your application? Accessibility. Um, again, throughout the world, more and more people are coming onto the web through their mobile device and discovery. So what does this kind of bring us to? Well, native applications are great for engagement. They're great for bringing users back to you. Um, they're great for um, keeping the users there and in, in, in longer sessions, viewing content, consuming content. And your web is greater for discovery. So, if they're going to come to you to find your, your latest course, or if they're just discovering you for the first time while they're trying to learn Python or C++ or C. In summary, it, it kind of comes down to this. If you want to achieve high growth through discovery, but you also want to bring your users back and engage them and have that multiple channels and multiple points of access into your, your OpenEdX uh, instance, you want to provide a strong web experience, but also a strong native mobile experience. And when I say native, I also here mean um, native hybrid experience. So in Open edX, the applications that are, that are open source currently, we use a hybrid approach, which means we have web views built into the applications, for example, for a lot of the Xbox, which are reaching out to the, the LMS and pulling in those Xbox through a web view, because we don't currently have native implementations for those Xbox, but we still want to provide access to them. So what is edX doing currently for mobile? Um, we have two, uh, two applications, one for iOS and Android, that are in feature parity. Um, but recently what we've been doing is we've continued the, the hybrid mobile approach to our applications. We've tried to simplify our UI design um, to utilize a, more of the Android and iOS patterns so that our users are more comfortable when they enter the applications and they're also using uh, modern design. And we tried to improve the navigation so that the users can get into the course content more quickly or discover course content more quickly. Um, we're currently on release 2.14 for our um, edX's implementation, and that's available to everyone at the repositories that are down below. And on the website, I'm not, I believe it, Hawthorne is when you'll see a lot of this coming out, but um, a, a greater emphasis on mobile first design. Um, I think Ari gave a presentation yesterday that talked a lot about that. Mm -hmm and also um, improve layouts in the platform to support mobile web access in the LMS. So what's next? Um, currently the mobile team at least is working on improved initial engagement. When the users come into the app for the first time, it's that initial, what is this, why do I care? Um, it's free courses, but here's how you discover them, things like that. Um, automated QA platform, um, my pet project has been working with a developer to automate our QA platform. Um, with Android fragmentation the way it is, it can be difficult to manually test on a lot of devices. So we're, we, I think it was two or three months ago, created a new repository called edX App Test, which we're building out um, automated tests for our Android and iOS devices. 
And then improved language support. Um, we have some test builds right now with five or six languages being supported in the application. Um, and again, continued improvements to mobile web. Without going into much detail again, because Ari gave a great presentation yesterday that talked about mobile web. More importantly, web in general. Um, so that's kind of the summary. Uh, that's it for my talk. Uh, if you want to reach me, please stop me in the hall. Uh, you can find me on Slack as AJ uh, and also uh, on GitHub. Are there any questions? Okay. I have a question. Yeah. Um, what do you think of progressive web apps and do you see that as kind of competing with here, I'm progressive web apps on the website, being able to instantly load your app, being able to save it to, the, to the, your home page on your mobile device? Do you see that taking over the mobile, native mobile app experience or do you still think they'll be? So I don't have any personal experience with progressive, but I think that it, it's a, potentially just another avenue. Um, and yeah, so I, I don't know how to comment on that directly because I don't have any experience with it. Okay. Thank you. So that was all the talks that we had for today. Um, is there any other questions for any of the speakers that we've had up here? Any question about the uh, coach and viewers? Um, what do you think about doing for assessment? Do you actually mind coming up here just so people on Sorry. will be able to be here? You should come up with a social yeah, 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 repeat the question. Yeah. 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 All right, so Peter's question is, what is the plan for assessment? Uh, so we have a, <laughs> we have a third, uh, we have a third tool for assessment. It is called Task Grader. It's been used with um, France IOI. Uh, it's a huge association in France that prepares for the International Olympiads of uh, Informatics, computer science. Um, and basically, it's uh, well, it's an auto grader that can get the that can do a static code verification, compilation errors, um, uh, memory consumption, CPU cycles consumption, anything uh, that is related to grading a code will be uh, uh, will be assessed. So we we actually use a third tool for that. And what we try to we will try to do in the next uh, years is to uh, merge Web Linux with Codecast, the thing to record the code and the voice, and the assessment tool in one single tool. Any other questions for any of the speakers? All right. So we can wrap up a little bit. Thank you all. Thanks.